Hey everyone, it's Joe from GreenLightSound.com, and today we've got a look at a legendary processor, the Fairchild Compressor, and not many of us are fortunate enough to own this extremely rare and extremely expensive piece of hardware, but lucky enough, there are many plug-in emulations of this that exist nowadays. I've got three up on the screen right now. I've got the UAD version on the left, I've got the IK Multimedia version on the top right, and the Waves version on the bottom right but are all based upon that same exact piece of gear, the Fairchild 670, which is the stereo version, or the 660, the mono version. For today, we're gonna to be taking a look at the UAD version. This is one of my favorite versions in plug-in form. And this particular version models all the tubes and everything else going on behind the scenes. If you take a look at the UAD legacy version, which I don't have up on the screen right now, that one does not model the tubes in the inside, this does. So this kind of gives you that sonic signature in addition to the regular compression characteristics and curves that come from the Fairchild compressor. So the actual hardware Fairchild was developed in the early 1950s for broadcast and record cutting applications. And some of the controls on there are specifically related to those applications. So as recording developed through the late 50s and early 60s, it became more prevalent in recording studios as engineers discovered its usefulness in coloring and shaping tone. One of its most notable uses was at Abbey Road Studios where most of the Beatles vocals from 1964 on and Ringo's drums were processed with Fairchild's, among many other sources that the Beatles used as well. There's a kind of a famous whoosh sound that Ringo's cymbals make in some recordings that is a direct result of the Fairchild compressor being applied to them. So behind the scenes in this Fairchild, it's a big beast. It's a 6U rack mounted unit. It weighs nearly 70 pounds. It's got 20 tubes and 11 transformers in there. And as I said before, some of the plugins model these. This UAD version does indeed model those. It had the fastest attack times for a compressor at the time, and that had to do with its broadcast usage. Those fast attack times wouldn't be surpassed for a decade until FET-style compressors like 1176s came along that had much faster attack times. So that combination of fairly fast attack times and longer release times eliminated artifacts but resulted in a really smooth compression characteristic, which is what the Fairchild is known for. So to get right into the settings, right past our VU meter, we've got this control for the meter, left-lat and right-vert. Left-right is its normal stereo mode, lat-vert is its mid-side mode. And the, that lat-vert, that's originally from record mastering, and the terms lateral or side-to-side -side and vertical up and down refer to the mechanical modulations in a vinyl record groove. So the middle signals are routed to the lat channel and the side signals are routed to the vert channels. So when we set the controls to lat vert over here and we unlink the controls down here, we can have independent control of our mid and side signal, which is kind of cool. And then left, right is normal stereo operation. And we'll link the controls again together to have the left and right sides compress the same amount, though you can compress them at different amounts and unlink them if you wanted to. So moving on to the next two controls, you've got the input gain and the threshold. And the amount of signal compression is determined by both the input gain and the threshold controls. So for less distortion with the same amount of compression, you would lower the input gain and increase the threshold control. On the other hand, you could do the opposite, increase the input gain and lower the threshold for a similar amount of compression with more distortion. Now here comes the section that usually trips people up, the time constant, because it doesn't have a setting, it doesn't have attack and release controls like most modern compressors would. It is different. Time constant number one and two were considered pop settings. Time constants three and four were considered classical music settings and five and six were completely program dependent. Most hardware compressors are left on one or two most of the time if they're found in a studio. So going through these time constants, number one has an attack of 200 microseconds and a release of 300 milliseconds, fast attack, slow release. Time constant number two was a 200 microsecond attack and an 800 millisecond release. So same attack time, different release time. Time constant number three, we've got a 400 microsecond attack and a two second release time. Number four, we've got an 800 microsecond attack and a five second release time. So we're getting really long with our release times here. And five and six are where things get strange. Five has a 200 microsecond attack, so just like the first two settings. But its release is dependent upon the material. It's two seconds for transients and 10 seconds for overall many multiple peaks. And number six has a 400 microsecond attack, so just like setting number three, but it's got a release time of 300 milliseconds for transients and 10 seconds for multiple peaks and 25 seconds for a consistently high level, a 25 second release time, which is crazy. So those are your basic controls. Now this version does have some extra features 
like a side chain filter so the low end doesn't trigger too much compression. We've got output control. We've got a mix knob here. We've got a headroom dial here, which clockwise, turning this clockwise, will push the plugin into gain reduction and distortion more easily. The balance controls the bias, but moving it changes the amount of additive signal deflection or thud you get in it. The DC threshold down here, which you could change on the original unit by calibrating it, it controls the ratio of compression as well as the knee width. So turning it clockwise lowers the ratio and broadens the knee and also lowers the threshold. So those are just a few of the extra controls in this unit. But basically, if you understand that pushing the input gain, lowering the threshold, and choosing one of these time constants will get you the amount of compression you want, you're going to be in good shape. And for most uses, you're going to stick with time constant one or time constant two. One of the most common uses of a Fairchild is on a drums bus. So we're going to try that now. First thing I'm going to do is bypass the compressor. This is a processed drum mix but with no bus compression going on. Here is just the mix without any Fairchild. So we're now going to engage the Fairchild. So you can hear a little bit of coloration to the tone for sure. Here it is without. If I match the output, I'll boost it a little bit. You can definitely hear it grab those peaks and hear that recovery time breathe a little bit. Now, if I don't want to push it quite as hard, let's see what we get. And that'll result in compression that you can kind of glue everything together with, but not really hear a noticeable amount of compression pumping or anything like that. So again, without and with. We could also crush the compressor. Without. And with. And if we do that in parallel, we get some really cool effects. Bring down the mix knob here. Next instrument we're going to try it on is bass and here it is without any compression. And we'll engage the compressor and set it up. We're going to stick with time constant one again. Here it is without again. Just smooth things out nicely. I want to move to time constant two here and try it on that setting. I'll have a little bit longer release time. Remember, same attack time here, but a little bit longer release. bypass it as we play. Just nicely smooth things out and you can hear some of that saturation in there as well. We could also mess with the headroom here. Which results in a little bit more distortion. Another really common use for the Fairchild is on a vocal bus. Usually on a vocal bus I'll leave it on time constant number one for that little bit faster release time. Let's dial this one in. Here it is without any compression.
Sweet harmony I remember last September Then we'll dial it in with some compression. Sweet harmony I remember last September Back when we Without sweet harmony, I'll engage here. I remember last September, back when we were we. If we want to get more aggressive? We could sweet harmony. I remember last September, back when we were we. Now, if you're listening on a really nice monitoring system or good headphones, you'll notice there's a sort of a sheen applied to the vocals that wasn't there without the Fairchild. Listen closely for that. You're not going to hear so much of a compression characteristic as something's getting slammed or like you're parallel compressing with an 1176 or something. You're going to hear more of just this nice sheen on top of the vocal as the vocal is being glued together. So again, we'll start without it. Listen for that little bit of sheen on top of the vocal. Sweet harmony I remember last September back when we So it's a subtle compression, but it just adds a nice smoothness, a nice creaminess to the vocal bust there. So there it is, the Fairchild compressor, the legendary Fairchild, all of its controls and how we can kind of easily set it up. We are lucky to live in an age when we have access to a digital version of this because the actual hardware unit, if you have an original, is so expensive and so rare nowadays. There are very few people who own one. And if you do, consider yourself very lucky. If you have any questions or comments, let me know in the comment section down below. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already so we can keep you in the loop as to what's coming up next, and I will see you in the next one.